The end of the book of Galatians is not a sentiment consistent with a man who was looking to create division. It sounds like a man who's tired of division, who doesn't want it anymore, and who doesn't want the pain that it caused. And if peace had been possible, he would have embraced it. 1 Corinthians has this incredibly harsh tone. Here's how he ends it. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. He says to Rome in the first chapter, perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you. He says to the Ephesian saints, who we cannot be with because he is imprisoned yet again, but that you may know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I will send him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us so that he may comfort your hearts. To the Philippians, he says, For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For a man who regards God's household as being what it is and longs to be with the members of his household, I imagine that the isolation of imprisonment was pain to him. Um, But you say, I just don't long for the fellowship of the saints the way that Paul did. If you don't long for the fellowship of saints manifest in the local gathering of the saints the way that the Apostle Paul did, you need to understand that it's only because you don't long for Christ the way that the Apostle Paul did. Because it was Christ and his fellow believers that drew him to them. And that is what this entire section is about. We are connected to each other because we are connected to God through Christ. Therefore, we are kin and the strongest kind of kin that there could be. And if genuine fellowship with genuine Christians has become dull to you, it is because Christ has become dull to you. One of the things that I will explain to people, because I commonly get this when I give the gospel to people, I'm a Christian, but I don't need church. And then you go through and you find out they don't understand the gospel either. But the way that I understand, or rather the way that I explain this to them, is I say, you know what? You know what the gathering of the saints is? It's not where we get together and we have some boring guy give us some liturgy and and that's what we do. And it's this religious rhetoric and this whole process of religion that's dry and orthodox and all that. You know what it is? Do you have a good family? And I hope that they do, because sometimes this backfires on me. But I say, do you have a good family? And if they say, yeah, I have, I have a really good family. If they say, I don't, then I say, well, imagine that you did. Okay, and you got mom and dad who loves you, and you're unified by the love of the Father that, all, that you're all connected into. Okay, and mom and dad, they're from Cleveland. And you grow up, and things happen, you know. And one sibling moves to Dallas, the other moves to San Antonio, the other moves to Boston. But one time a year, and it's Thanksgiving, you guys come together. Do you look forward to that time? And they say, yeah, yeah, I do. Right, because you have a great relationship with your siblings. You have a great relationship with your parents. And you're connected by the fact that you all have the same father. You're in the same family. And that's how I explain church to them. Because we have that common bond and there's a longing to be with each other. And I see that longing in the scriptures. I see it in the Apostle Paul, and whenever I don't see it, I see a stern rebuke coming after it. And I see even the question of test yourselves to see whether or not you're actually in the faith. Such is the nature of your divisions. But I'd ask, is that true of you? Do you long to be with the saints? Do you long to be with the members of God's household? who are still here on earth in this time, in this context. I have a buddy who we have a group, text group, Rick is a part of it. And he said, can you guys pray for me? I'm giving the gospel to, I'm actually preaching. I'm preaching via Skype to an underground church in Pakistan. I said, absolutely, I'll do that. They had somehow found him on the internet and said, would you, would you do this for us? And so I asked him how he went and he explained the scenario to me. And it was him preaching through a laptop 
to a concrete bunker and there's 25 people huddled around this stream together who came together on the Lord's Day because it's illegal to do it there. They're huddled around the screen. They're sitting on the dirt. And they came to hear him. And I said, brother, I said, you need to know, man, if they need somebody else to fill that pulpit ever, I'm available. I don't care if it's five minutes. Notice, you let me know, man, if I don't have anything prepared, I'll, I'll pick something. I'll open the scriptures. I'll do whatever for those people. And I'll do it right now because I come from a culture who couldn't care less about the gathering of saints, who treats the local church the same way that they treat toiletries in the toiletries aisle of the grocery store. I like the packaging of this one. I don't like the packaging of this one. You know, I like 84% of the ingredients that are in this product, but because they're the remaining percentage and I don't like those, I'm just going to throw the rest of it out and I'm going to go down the road and I'm going to find something else. You know, maybe even I like 99%, but there is that 1%. So I'm going to take the spiritual capital that Christ has invested in me, right? Because he's given gifts to men. I'm going to take them and I'm going to do absolutely nothing with them in an absurd act of selfishness. So when I see your 25 people sitting in the dirt, huddled around a computer screen, I will give up my time. I will give it up right now because I come from American Christianity, which is anything other than what I see in there. We determine the quality of a church because of music. We determine it literally because of the color of the carpet. We determine it on the basis of preachers too funny, preachers not funny enough, preacher wears jeans, and what kind of heretic does that? Sermons are too long, sermons are too short, they're not long enough. They have children's programs, and I hate that. They don't have children's programs, and I hate that. I got a phone call a while ago from a brother, a genuine brother, and he hears my sermons, and he hears what I say, things about family integration in which I believe passionately. And he calls me and he says, I hear the things that you're saying. And he said, there aren't churches like yours around us. Should I get out of the church that I'm in? I said, are there genuine Christians there? He said, yes. I said, um, do they have the gospel there? He said, yes. And they're, it's very much not a perfect church. And I said, then absolutely you may not pull out of that church. And if you want to, you can go to another one if you need to. But you need to find a place, park, and go there. And don't use me. And if somebody's listening to this online, I'm not the one that you can use to do that. Because they don't have a youth group, or they do have a youth group, or whatever. There are churches that aren't perfect, but they're the gathering of the saints. They are members of God's household, and you are to be drawn to them. And I don't ever want to be used as a means for somebody to pull out of the local gathering of the saints over something that we bicker about. And we bicker about building cosmetics, and we seek for personality in preachers. There's a church not that long of a drive from here. Very famous preacher, one that has taught me much, and I've learned much from when this guy doesn't fill his pulpit and somebody else does, from what I've heard, 60% of the people don't come. Literally is that high. And he is out of his pulpit half a year. I have a friend who went into the church bookstore and said, uh, hey, you know, I mean, God forbid, but what do you think would happen if, if so-and-so died? And the person behind the counter, the lady, starts laughing. But not like a funny laugh, like a, like a chuckle and like a... And she says, we'd be done. We're done. That's it. If he has only 40% when he's there, if I were him, I wouldn't have the 40% left either because I would rebuke all of them. I would rebuke all of them for loving a man more than they love Christ and loving that man more than they love the members of Christ and being profoundly selfish and dishonoring the scriptures and dishonoring Christ. We have love for the brethren. And there are two categories, really. There are the ones who are false converts who couldn't care less because they're not actually in Christ. And then there are many true converts who bought into this notion because of the influence of the false converts. 
that the local church has no place, that the gathering of saints has no place, that this community of faith really has no fit place, and they could take it or leave it based upon the concept of Christianity that they've been given by the culture and by so many people who are not actually in the body of Christ. And then there are those who do come week after week and who bail immediately after the sermon is over except when they have occasion to gossip. In that regard, they stay and sow seeds of discord, such as the nature of this country. Can you imagine meeting Christ and having understood what the terms of this community were? That the purchase of this community was the blood of Christ, was the brokenness of Christ on your behalf, and you spurned it. You cared nothing about it. You didn't show up because somebody hurt your feelings or whatever. Every one of us has had our feelings hurt. Every one of us. The body of Christ on earth is that manifestation right now of God's household. And you better be taking spiritual inventory if you have a low regard for that. Very much. Christ died for this privilege. And on the other hand, I will tell you this. Our brothers and sisters, you are orphans no longer. If you know Christ, you are orphans no longer. You are in the body of Christ. You are children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we would be called children of God. And we are members of that household. That is the greatest gift on earth, to be connected with God and to be connected with each other. And irrespective of what you were estranged from prior to Christ, you are connected to an everlasting body. And we will be connected in eternity by what we are connected with here, and that is worship to Christ.